Good morning. Okay, we'll, we'll try it again later in the service, but good morning to you, and we're grateful that you've joined us here for our worship service this morning. My name's Ryan. I get the privilege of serving as one of the pastors here, and I'm glad to get to worship. Whether you're here in person or you're joining us here online, we are glad to have you. Would you join us in our call to worship this morning, a practice that we do here at Skyview on a weekly basis intended to turn our hearts away from the things that might distract us, the many burdens, responsibilities, and expectations that perhaps even arose this morning, that we in this time and space try to turn our hearts collectively towards worship. And so if you're able to, we invite you to stand as we read this responsive reading. I'll read the leader portion, and we will all respond where it says all. The bread of life opens our eyes. The word of life opens our ears. The risen one shows us God's own brokenness. By those wounds, we are healed. Peace be with you. Would you stand and continue in our worship this morning through song?
Welcome to Skyview. My name is Stephanie. I'm one of the worship leaders here. If you're joining us online, drop a note in the chat. And this morning, uh, find an unfamiliar face and introduce yourself or say hello to a friend as we uh, continue with our service. Isn't that the beauty of the body of Christ is that you get caught up chatting and miss your cue on stage. So I hope you can forgive me this morning. But it is great to be here in the house of the Lord together. There's lots of things happening in life of here, life here at Skyview. Let's try that again. Life here at Skyview. If you're new with us for the first time or are just trying to get to know more about us, we want to we do these things very regularly here at Skyview because we recognize that Sometimes we have questions about the place that we want to worship. Justifiably, we're trying to get to know a place that's not just about our own worship, but about a collective experience. And so here in a, two Sundays on April 28th, we invite you to one of our regular welcome lunches. Maybe some of you have been to these. It's a great time, first of all, just for free meal. You can't pass up a free meal. But you can come downstairs and meet with our pastoral team and staff Just a great chance to get to know a little bit about our history, ask some questions, and just an informal time to start the process if you're looking for a church or want to be a part of a place called Skyview. So the only thing that we ask is that if you do, and if you don't, that's okay, you can come too, but we'd like you to sign up, and the best way you can do that is either reach out to our church office or you can find us at the welcome booth at the back in the foyer after service. The last thing is also if you're new and you're just looking to connect, you don't want to come to our welcome lunch, but you just want to connect with somebody, that's another great place is at the welcome booth. You'll find myself or one of our other pastoral team that will reach out to you. And I promise you won't get signed up for a million newsletters just by stopping by. We always assure people just in case you're nervous. We'd like to move into a time of worship in our service where we give back our tithes and our offerings. I would invite our ushers to come forward. I think about this time a lot and what it means for us here at Skyview. We have a lot of values here in this church. One of them is transparency. I think that sometimes in a church context, we can get confused about what it means that we're doing in this moment. Perhaps there's perspectives of churches that we just really want people's money, that there's pressure maybe to give so that we can have income, so that we can do the things that we do. Surely there is a part of that. 
That the money that we give, the tithes and the offerings that are given in moments like this do fund the ministry and mission of our local church. But there's another side to it and why it's included in our time of worship. That we believe the offering does something to us. That when we give back, it first recognizes that we know the source from where it has all come. But second, in giving, we put ourselves in a position of trust and faith in a renewed sense. To say, Lord, I trust that as I give this back, you will provide all that I need as you have day in and day out. So in that spirit, we invite you to give this morning. It, maybe it's a, a weird practice, too, for some. I think about this a lot because some of us give online, and it's a regular donation. comes out of our account or charges to our card, and we don't even think about it. Something I try to do as I pass the basket is just pause and say, thank you. And so whether you're giving here in person or if you're new with us or you give online, let this be a moment of worship for us today. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the many things that you do in and through our hearts. Lord, we know that the tithes and the offerings that are given, that you will do something incredible with them, that you'll multiply it in a way that only you can. But Lord, we also give in this moment anticipating that you would do something in our hearts. Perhaps reveal to us the things that we need to let go of, the fears, the burdens, the expectations that we might put upon ourselves, that in this moment, Lord, we would experience freedom from that. That we give in faith, knowing that you want to change our hearts. And so, Lord, we ask in faith that you would do something to us that perhaps we don't even know needs to be done. Lord, we are grateful for the way that you invite us into regular worship of you and trust that you're not done with us yet. Lord, we pray this in your name. Amen. You have been our dwelling place forever.
something that maybe you haven't considered before, but it's just striking you as, yeah, God, that's his goodness in my life right now. Consider that. Meditate on him as we sing this one more time. When the sun comes up, satisfy us before the day has passed us by. Before our hearts forget all your goodness, satisfy us with your love. through 1 John today, chapter 3 with Pastor Anne, and it's all about God's love for us. And one of the most beautiful displays of his love, of course, is Easter. We've just celebrated this gift of a Savior, of a Redeemer, and we're going to sing of his grace today. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no
this time you can have a seat as we enter into a time of prayer and it's a, a practice we have at Skyview to really think not just within our community and lay our prayers um, before the altars and before his feet but to think beyond our community and the world and what is happening um, around us so that we can be more aware but also can pray into that so hear these prayers this morning and you may hear the response, I will say, Lord, in your mercy. And you can respond with, hear our prayers. So in the name of Christ Jesus this morning, let us pray for the needs of the world, saying, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Holy One, as the risen Christ opened the minds of the disciples, to understand the scriptures and gave them power through the Holy Spirit to walk boldly in this world. Open us today to the healing, wisdom, and faith given in your word. Prince of Peace, as we share and read of how you showed your wounded hands and feet to those terrified apostles. We ask that you reveal to your church and to people of prayer in every faith the wounds of our neighbors, the fears of those around us, of individuals and families, and the road towards healing. Lord, in your mercy, Author of life, we beg for peace among nations. Every day we read of new conflict, of new missiles being fired, of war-torn happening throughout our world, the world that you created. We think of the recent attacks on Israel. We think of the ongoing attacks on the Ukraine. We can only imagine in the words on the pages we read of the terror, the hurt, physical, emotional, the needs that go unmet, the lack of food, the crying, the hurt. This morning, we cry out for peace. We ask you, Lord, to guide the leaders in those nations, in our nations, in the parliaments, the judges, the juries. Let us learn diplomacy. Let us learn grace, humility. And let our ways be formed so that all in our world may have plenty. Lord, in your mercy. Light in our darkness, let your brightness burn in places shrouded in violence. We read of the attacks in Sydney. And again, Lord, we question. We question our humanity. We question um, the gift of the world that you have given us and what we do with that. But Lord, we know the hurts the mental struggles, the emotional turmoil. And we pray, Lord, that you will just be with those family members in particular today, Lord.
Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Healer of every ill, we pray for all who are in need, for those refugees of war and all who are displaced by earthquakes, storms, for the rescue workers and medical teams in places like Taiwan, for those whose bones are weary, for those who show us the power of community to give hope to the frightened, and for all who have asked for our prayers. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. You ask us, Lord, you command us to bring our deepest needs to you, O oh God. And now we pray for those right here in these chairs and for those who are watching online or for those who could not physically be here today, Lord, but are part of our Skyview community. I'm going to name some of these. And there also will be time that you can just in silence respond. And Lord, hear these prayers this morning. We think and pray for our pastoral staff. We pray for Jennifer and Christy, our admin support. We pray for our ministry coordinators and all our volunteers. We pray for the students who are finishing up a long semester. As they enter into finals or final papers, give them strength, Lord. We pray for the Shrout family who are experiencing the loss of a father today. Bring comfort and peace. We pray for those who have just had a tough week. And whatever that looks like for each and every one of us. in your mercy hear our prayers Father God we trust in your abundant mercy we commend into your care for all whom we pray through Jesus Christ our Savior Amen Good morning, everybody. It's time for Kids Minute. Yes. Come on up. Great. When we are at Kids Church, we tend to focus on one story a week or one story over a couple weeks, right? And sometimes it's hard to see the bigger picture when we're focusing on these little stories. So we're going to... Uh, focus on a little bit. We're going to zoom out today and we're going to connect a bunch of stories. But I'm going to ask a question, not to you guys, because you guys are always like really paying attention. You're answering questions. I'm going to put it out there because there, this is a question for people 
of a certain age. So, for all of you out there, was there anything when you were at school that maybe it was like a Friday afternoon and something was brought into the classroom that you were like, yes! It was maybe very tall on some wheels. What would it be? TV VCR. Do you guys know what a VCR is? <laughs> no. Okay. So, like, imagine kind of like a flattened brick, and you put it into a box, and it plays a movie. So, I don't have a big TV to wheel into the basement, down, although there is a big TV in the basement. I don't have a VCR, but we are going to watch a movie today. So... Yeah, so we're gonna go downstairs and watch a movie and try to connect some of these stories that we've been talking about. All right, sound good? Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for each one of the people sitting on the floor in front of me. Thank you that they are here today. Thank you for the adults in their life who got them ready and uh, made the trip to church. I thank you for their dedication. Uh, I pray that as we uh, watch this movie about the story of your love for us, um, that we would understand in a new way how, um, how you love us. Be with the adults and the teens upstairs as they hear from Pastor Anne. In your name I pray, amen. Just give the children time to get out and learn more. Okay, good morning. My name is Anne, and I'm one of the retired pastors here in Skyview. But as you know, pastors always find something or someone to minister to, because that is our ministry, people. So this morning I say that um, it's an honor and a privilege to share some thoughts from God's word. I must say after cataract surgery, it is so good to see you all in true colors. <laughs> That's amazing. I don't really need them. But for reading, I do, but I can see you very clearly. And I thank God for that. <clears throat> My husband and I, we pastored in many churches in Canada and first in Scotland. And we called it in these days co-pastoring because we were classed as equals with different gifts but we were co-pastors then, and assistant pastor, associate pastor, so that we became equals. Of course, some churches or denominations do not recognize that, and that is okay. It doesn't really matter, because we know who we are. God has called us to preach the gospel to those who have ears to listen and hungry. But as I wonder how many read in the newsletter the humor that Pastor John puts in. I like to read it, and it reminded me of, as a child, my sister and I, in the little village we lived in, we played that game. We would knock on a door and run <laughs> before the person came to the door. Very naughty, but good fun in those days, I must say. <laughs> but as I look at the humor, I always look for the spiritual meaning in it. And as I lay in bed one night, I was thinking, 
it reminds me so much of Isaiah when we're told in chapter 40. I'll read it. We've got minutes, time to do it. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. But the run there doesn't mean run away like the little boy told the pastor. No, he was to keep on going, not grow weary, not be faint, but be renewed in God's Holy Spirit. And then, as Jesus said, come to me, all you are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. So I've said enough on that. Let us stand and read our prayer for illumination before I read the scriptures. God of all who doubt and believe, by the gift of your spirit, enable us to hear with our ears, to see with our eyes, and to touch with our hands your word of life. Jesus Christ, our Lord and our God. Amen. The reading this morning is from 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. And if we could please remain standing while I read these few verses. See what love the Father has given us. Or, as the new NIV says, and that is what's on the board, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Dear friends, now we are children of God, And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, Sin is lawlessness. But you know that he appeared so that he might take away our sins. And in him is no sin. No one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. Dear children, Do not let anyone lead you astray. The one who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. You can be seated. May God bless the reading of his word. We all have memorable days in our life. But if we are honest without naming all the days that bring good memories to us. There's nothing, there's no memory compares with the time our Lord saw us. I say our Lord saw us because I wrote a book called The God Who Sees and took us to himself as we cried out to God. Can we ever forget when the Lord our God, our Heavenly Father, lovingly took to himself a person, a people, seeking for something to satisfy. God, not caring where we had been or what we had done, took us just as we were, sinful, hurting, wounded, confused and wondering if this was all that life had to offer us. No manipulation, no trick. He who knew everything about us gave no judgment, 
no condemnation, embraced us with a tender understanding, just as the true loving God of the universe who loved us. And as we asked forgiveness for our sin, oh, the peace and relief that we felt because we had found the one who really cared for us. The love he gave us, taking away all our fears, we just had to trust him and have faith in him. Oh, what an amazing God we have, sending his son to suffer and die on the cross, carrying our sin that we may be forgiven and rising again that we may have eternal life. Wow, what a God we serve. However, as you know, dear friends, that was only the beginning. We had so much to learn as we attended the church, met others who shared the same God and Savior as we did. To know we were not alone was a great relief. Then reading with an eager mind, hearing sermons and instructions to us, correcting us, changing our hearts so as to be in fellowship with Almighty God through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then in fellowship with fellow believers. And this was one of the reasons that John wrote the book of First John. The author John the Divine, or John the Evangelist, as he is sometimes known, inspired by God, because we believe that all were all the gospel, all the Bible is inspired by God. He wrote first, second, and third John, the Gospel of John, and the book of Revelation. Although John does not say to whom he wrote this epistle or letter to, it is God's word, so it is penned to all of us, because the Bible is for all of us. Young and old, new Christians, mature Christians. You see, it is also a good reminder of who we really are and what our God has done and is continuing to do in our lives and in others. John, who wrote the book, witnessed the resurrection and so became a child of God. He had seen with his eyes, heard with his ears, and believed with his heart, knowing that this was true. Jesus Christ had died. He'd lived, died, rose again for the world, for us. Last week's theme um, that Caleb was preaching on was light and darkness mostly from chapter one. And for us as Christians, we must continually walk in the light. That is keeping close to Jesus Christ. John in chapter two warns against heresy. He emphasizes two main safeguards for us so that we will not be led astray from the various teachings, preachers, and I say preachers, so that we will not be led astray by him. Firstly, the safeguard that the gospel we have heard from the beginning, the one that brought us in union with Jesus Christ, must remain in us. Jesus said in John's gospel, Remain in me, that's in Christ, and I 
will remain in you. So this morning, let us muse now on the passage of Scripture read to us from 1 John. I asked a question to myself first, who am I? Then to all of us, who are you? Putting all our academic things aside, our achievements, whether it be practical or still learning, but who are we? And that's my first point. We are, as we read, children of God. And I believe this is for all ages because we are always learning new lessons. Even in our old age, we have to look back at what we've learned and bring them again into practice if we've slipped up on some of them. And we'll come to that. We are children of God by his grace that we are called and are children of God. That's what the scripture says. God's love in action has made us children of the living God. Love originated from God, who is love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, we will love because he first loved us. God is truth. He will never mislead us. God is true and faithful and never wavers. He never lies. He is holy. And he doesn't confuse us. He is steadfast and true. That is why we must keep Christ in the center and God. Speaking of God, one dictionary of theology says about God, and I quote, the absolute or attributes, or attributes are reserved for God alone, free from limitation or restraint. No one shares these divine perfections. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. He is omnipresent. That is everywhere present. Basic things we learned as we were getting our homiletics. And God is omnis omnipresent. That is everywhere present at the same time. We, dear friends, are his beloved children. We are the objects of God's great love. We recognize his great love because of the cross. When our God sent his only son to die on the cross for the sin of the world and for my sin. We are a people who have decided at one point, to follow Jesus Christ. We are sons and daughters of the living God, not only for now, but he is our living hope, as we sang, for the future too. Ephesians 1 and 5 says, we are adopted as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has blessed us in the beloved. God called his son Jesus, his beloved, on numerous occasions. Remember at Christ's baptism, God the Father said, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. The world does not know us. We are strangers in the world whose true natures cannot be understood. Natures that are being changed continually 
as the Holy Spirit speaks to us. We live in the world, and keeping Christ in our heart, we love the people in the world. We love them. But we are separated, so we hate its sinful ways because we know the damage it does. We hate the sinful ways, but we are obliged to love them if we have the love of Christ in us. Sinful ways that ruin and hurt and wound families, those around them, and kill. That's why we have wars today. Wars kill. God has opened our eyes to see the difference between living in sin and living for God. Aren't we thankful? We see the difference when we come to Christ. Verse 2 reads, What we will be has not yet been made known. And this tells us there is a future and we, the children of God, soon learn secondly, after giving our life to Christ, that the love of God has more for us. He's not done with us. He has more for us. Thank God for that too. As a new Christian, we have much to learn so as to become mature. We only have to look at the example of a baby and he calls us the children of God. That's what we are. But we just need to look at a baby as parents feed, nurture them. They expect them to grow, not to remain as a baby. They expect them to grow. And so they begin to make a noise with their mouth. They crawl. They walk. They stumble and they fall. They receive a few bumps along the way. That can be true of us too as Christians. Then picking themselves up and perhaps learning not to climb stairs or up on things that will hurt or harm them. And if you have ever watched a child looking at an older sibling and the baby or the child tries to mimic them, trying to do the things that they do, but they're not ready for it. And they want to become more than they are when they are too young. Much like the lessons believers are taught, through our Heavenly Father and God's Word, the Bible. So, dear friends, we start off, and excuse the term, as baby Christians, new believers in the faith. But God has a bigger picture, teaching us, correcting us, until we are mature and can hear our Heavenly Father speak to us himself. Then there comes a time in our life when the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11 rings true for us. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. But when I grew up, I put away childish things. It is good for us, out of love for God, to defend the faith, the gospel, and that is good. But it is not enough. We must change by being drawn to God and hearing what he's teaching us. We must practice the gospel and live it out if we ever wish to draw others to Jesus Christ, our Savior. We are told in Ephesians 5 and 1 to be imitators of God as beloved children 
and live in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Dear friends, we must remove barriers or stumbling blocks out of people's way. We can prove the love of God is in us when we become a practical force and example. God never gives up on us, and we praise him for that. Like good parents who never give up on their child, they somehow know that growing takes time, and children are all different. As the children of God are different, all growing at a different pace. We could be the same age, but we're growing at a different pace. Age doesn't really matter too much, except when you get old. <laughs> I'm often reminded of a series called, and I've said this before, I think, Becoming a Mature Christian, based on the scripture that is very often used at weddings, and we do have a wedding, or we don't, but there is a wedding coming up soon. The hope is that this will be practiced in the marriage. But as we know, as counselors or pastors know, this does not happen overnight. It can take years or a lifetime for both in a marriage to master this scripture. Let me read it again, just in case we've forgotten it. Love is patient, love is kind. And we're talking about the agape love of God, not the other loves that we have, Eris and the other ones. We're talking about agape love. Love is kind, it does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud, it does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no records of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. Mastering all these qualities, I call them, of love, can take a lifetime and makes us think, how am I doing? How am I doing in this? Not an easy passage. It doesn't happen overnight. And then I come to my third point. Purify yourself. Verse 3 of this passage we read. When I say purified, take out things that contaminate us. We will never be perfect, but purify yourself, not someone else. Oh, isn't it so good to point the finger, I must purify me. And that's what it says, purify yourself. The Apostle Paul in Titus 2 and 14 tells us one of the main purposes of the cross is to purify a chosen people to be conformed to Christ. It says, Jesus Christ gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Christ's death applied to our heart and life will change us if we are a true child of God and allow him to do the work in us. 
This is what John is telling us in 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 to 11. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. We are not told to purify others, as I said. We can teach others, and that is good. But we can only purify ourselves and live the life. Christ, if we are willing, will purify us when we obey his teaching and his word. Sinfulness in our life prevents the pure love of God from possessing our being. We heard last week that there is a cheap grace and costly grace. Costly grace can mean us purifying our own selfish nature and letting Jesus control our very being and actions. Not easy to come accomplish because we always think I am right. Not easy. That costs us to put ourselves aside like Christ on the cross. That's the cost. Christ has paid the cost, but it's a costly grace we have to act on to. So costly grace can mean us purifying our own selfish nature and letting Jesus control us out of our very being and actions. Not easy to accomplish, of course not. It is costly. But we can have the victory over, not others, but over ourselves our own sinful nature, the things that want to come out and defile us and may defile others. The fundamental truth of the new life in Christ is righteousness, which leads us to my fourth and last point. I'm not going to say praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Which leads us to my fourth and last point. Righteousness is necessary. Verse 7. God is righteous. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, sin is lawlessness. And if you ever want to read about lawlessness, read Thessalonians. The righteous one, sinless, Jesus Christ, being crucified to make righteous the sinner. This righteousness is not automatically transferred to the sinner, but because in faith we desire to act righteously, we can become righteous, proving our sonship. Christ appeared so that he might take away our sins. Hallelujah for that. Romans 4 and 6 to 8. David says the same thing when he speaks of the blessedness of the one to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord will never count against him. We have turned from our own self-righteousness to the righteousness of God. Our righteousness, therefore, is conforming to God's image in a childlike manner and simplicity. Because one of my theme verses to keep me humble, and I'm maybe not that humble, but before I preach, I always say it has a different meaning theologically, but for me it meant when I am apart from Christ, 
I am nothing. That's what it means to me, personally. Apart from him, I said we have to keep a close relationship with him. So our self-righteousness, therefore, is conforming to God's image in a childlike manner and simplicity. So righteousness that is inside our heart must reveal itself on the outside, outward in our actions and our attitudes. Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 15, it's not what goes into a person's mouth that defiles him. It's the words that come out that reveal the sin in my heart and in our heart. And as a worship group come up at this time, I will conclude by giving you some of the goals of this morning's message, that the goals it has been. Firstly, to give us a fresh look at who God is and who we are, knowing and giving us assurance that our God loves us unconditionally. Secondly, to remind us how he has lavished his love on us. We have experienced or can experience his great love for us. Thirdly, to know we are in Christ Jesus, we are children of God, and if we obey his commands, we will remain in love, just as Christ obeyed his Father's commands. For even Christ showed us the way by obeying his heavenly Father. We do not preach sinless perfection in the Nazarene church and in any, some other denominations. That's not our goal. For none of us are perfect. And we err sometimes but our Savior welcomes us back and understands our weakness. First John chapter 2, 1 said, My dear children, I write this to you, so you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And then lastly, to give us hope. And I close with the words from Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. So we do not lose heart. We do not let anyone lead us astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he is righteous. May our Lord continue to work in our hearts and bless us. Amen. Would you stand with us as we continue in worship? We're going to sing an old hymn that has a bit of a fresh take on it. And it uses some um, older language, but I think the picture of Christ's love is wonderfully clear here. Can it be that I should get Died he for me who caused his pain For me who him to death
this morning at the foot of the cross
And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you. Thank you.